Hello and welcome to the Doofcast, the official variety podcast of doofmedia.com. My name is Scott Daly, but they call me Daywalker. And I'm Matt Freeman, and I have all their strengths and none of their weaknesses. Well, I mean, like, except for the whole blood drinking thing, that's that's kind of a weakness. I mean... This week on the show, it is time for another one of our Deconstructing Director series where we take a look at all the films of of a single director and we talk about them. This week, we are discussing Guillermo del Toro's fourth film, 2002's Blade Two. This will be the only film in our series that was not written by del Toro. But I think, Matt, as we go through this conversation, uh, we'll see that this is very much a Guillermo del Toro movie. Absolutely. He finds his way to get his, his fingerprints on it. Definitely, definitely. So we're going to talk all about Blade 2. It'll be a full spoilers discussion for that film. And uh, I think we're going to wrap everything up this week with you talking a little bit about a new video game you've been playing, right, Matt? Mm-hmm. I did I did purchase uh, Cyberpunk 2077, and I have some thoughts. I can't wait to hear those thoughts. But first, we got to talk about Blade 2. Blade. We represent the ruling body of the vampire nation. They're offering you a truce. They want to meet with you. You sure about this? They'll take us in deeper than we've ever been. Now, those he has sworn to kill need his help to fight a new breed of terror. They're no longer top of the food chain. Our forces are ready to fight, but we need a leader. Let me get this right. You want me to hunt them? For you? Ooh, so exciting. Matt, what is Blade 2 all about? Blade forms an uneasy alliance with the Vampire Council in order to combat the Reapers, who are feeding on vampires. It was written by Del Toro and, no, sorry, directed by Del Toro and written by David S. Goyer. David S. Goyer, um, not the best name to see in a written by credit in the world, Matt. We were talking about this before we started recording, but yeah. David Esquire's history is long and sordid. He he wrote actually the first Blade movie. Um, he wrote this. He wrote Batman Begins. He has a story credit on The Dark Knight, uh, but he also wrote Batman versus Superman and um, yeah. Terminator Dark Fate, which some people like that movie. I don't know. Yeah. I, when you told me those movies earlier, I was literally struck dumb. I just couldn't. <laughs> I, I, I my brain kept trying to downshift into a reality where that could possibly make sense. Um, I mean, not that this movie is the worst thing in the world, right? I, we're gonna. Is, is this the time where we say that we we couldn't help liking this movie? Yeah, definitely. I think that's a way to start. I do want to like kind of step back and talk about Blade generally and our experience with blade in general before we dive into this movie but yeah i mean overall i think i found this an enjoyable experience um it's definitely not going to be my number one guillermo del toro film um probably not even close but it's a fun movie that holds up very well i think yes it's very much a 2002 movie i think in in Um, many ways i i do think We'll get into it, but the scenes where they cut to CG are some that's like the worst decision Del Toro's ever made. Um, maybe he didn't make it, maybe they needed to put CG in, but the, that the the dividing line between real action and CG action was very obvious. It was rough. I'm gonna be honest, it was better than I remember it being, <laughs> but it was still rough. Yes, it reminded me of the Neo fighting Smith's fight in The Matrix Reloaded, where mm-hmm. it's so obvious when it switches to CG versions of the characters, where yeah. they just stop moving like real people move. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just completely, yeah. Um, well, let's talk about Blade, because yeah. Blade is actually a Marvel property. Um, in fact, Marvel is going to be making a new Blade movie with Mahershala Ali starring as the main character. Um but this is a series like people talk about the movies that really defined uh, modern comic book blockbusters. Right. And they talk about X-Men and they talk about Spider-Man. Um, they don't talk about Blade. And I think they should, mm-hmm. because in 1998, a movie called Blade came out and it was excellent and very successful. And I do think that, like, if you want to look towards the movie that started this whole trend, I think you have to give Blade that credit. Yeah. D- so, like, does X Men happen without Blade? Does Spider Man happen without Blade? Maybe, but Blade came first. Yeah, right. I mean, 
even you know the, the you can even trace the you know the difference between blade and blade two as a sort of microcosm of like the the the, the two different aesthetics of comic book movies you sure, know sure. blade is a very serious dark um um uh, you know takes itself seriously takes the concept seriously takes the characters seriously mm-hmm. um uh, there, there's maybe a little bit of camp around the edges but mostly it's it's going for like high gothic like like tone this movie is just a, a wild um colorful you know uh extravagantly violent and 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 sort of self-consciously winking at the camera like indulgence in how badass that this this character is and mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and that's so the movies are different from each other and honestly it reminds me so much of like the still ongoing today kind of debate between like what kind of superhero movie or do, do you like do you like the serious dark ones or do you like the the flashy ones um with the, with a sense of humor and uh mm-hmm. it's yeah it's funny because i like both blade one and I, I probably like blade one more than blade two but i haven't seen it recently so maybe that's not even true I watched it. Um, I, I somehow found extra time to watch both these movies this week. Um, yeah, they're very different movies. Uh, I like them for very different reasons. Um, I think the most important thing, and we're going to spend half of this podcast talking about Wesley Snipes. I think the most important thing about both these movies is that Wesley Snipes is having so much fun playing this character. He mm-hmm. he he so clearly loves being Blade. Mm-hmm. He just loves it so much. And when I sat down to watch Blade Two, um, I, I like my I, I told my wife as i turned on blade the same thing i told you which is that they're they're rebooting this for the mcu with um herschel ali and she asks well who plays blade and i was like wesley snipes and she's like who's that and i was like what what what, what? <laughs> how do you not know wesley <laughs> snipes um but she, uh-huh. this is this is when the four-year difference between her and i becomes very apparent uh-huh. Um, and, and the, I guess the gender difference between us, <laughs> possibly, think, possibly, yes. I don't think, I don't think Elise was watching, uh, badass, uh, action movies when yeah. she was when in, yeah. in 1998 or whatever, Su- suplexing a guy, um, yeah. <laughs> in a, yeah, <laughs> wasn't, right. wasn't really her scene. Um, yeah. but yeah, it, it, they're, they're both very fun movies. I, I like blade for what it is. Um, but blade two is it's so much more fun in, in a, in a lot of very specific ways that I'm looking forward to, to really diving into with you. Sure. So, I mean, we have to center this whole conversation around our director because this is a deconstructing director series and, and this is del Toro's return to blockbuster filmmaking. Um, right. Like we, so far in his history, he's made the, the tiny independent film Kronos. Then he makes mimic, which is a film that he did not have a good time in the studio system. He retreats to Mexico or actually technically Spain, because uh, they ended up filming um, The De- Devil's Backbone in Spain, um, does, a, does a small independent movie, it does super well, and then he says, okay, I'm going back, I'm going to try to do this again, and I'm going to do it actually with the largest budget he's ever had, the biggest movie he's ever done is Blade Two, and uh, and overall, like pretty successful. I think this is what really cements his career. I think this is how he gets Hellboy, because Hellboy mm-hmm. is next for him after this. And I think it's how he ends up getting that movie, which I think is is really when Del Toro started becoming a name that uh, uh, most of the populace would have heard of him. For sure, yeah. I mean, this is definitely the first movie of his that I saw um, mm-hmm. in theaters. I mean, I, we didn't do the the thing where we talked about our experience with it, uh, but like my. Uh, my whole high school friend group was pretty obsessed with Blade Two when it came out in theaters. I, like I, I remember us going to see it and just, you know, freaking out at how how kind of delightfully violent and and indulgent it is in so many ways. Like I think <laughs> I I think I had several of the soundtrack songs like on like burned onto a a CD because that was what you did back then. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it's so fun. All, like all the gadgets are really cool. I think the design of the Reaper vampire is just really wonderful and classically Del Toro. So I understand why the uh, the um, I'm trying to think of how old you were. The 17 year old version of Matt would have yeah. been like, fuck yeah. yeah. Um, I, I don't remember when I saw this movie, to be honest. I do not think I saw this one in the theater. Um, this is actually like when I think of Blade before we sat down to do this, I remember the first movie very distinctly. Um, there's several key moments in the first movie that I have a lot of memory of. And then I remember the third movie having uh, Ryan Reynolds in it and being terrible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and I Blade 2, the Vagina Mouth movie, was mm-hmm. one that like I didn't remember until 
the movie opened and we see Nomak and we see the slit down his chin. And mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's this one. Yeah. I totally forgotten. So uh, for whatever reason, this movie did not stick in my memory very well. Um, Interesting. I, and I don't know if that's a, if that's a fault of the movie itself. It might be. But yeah, it's it's just the truth. For whatever reason, I did not I did not have very good memories of this movie. It all came back to me as I was watching, but I, I would not have predicted the plot of this movie for a million dollars if you had asked me a week ago. Yeah, I mean, I hadn't seen it in so long that I I forgot that Scud becomes a traitor. Like, even though that seems yeah. like that would be the sort of thing that just like how could you forget that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I think I remembered it as it was like about to happen. I was like, oh yeah, there's the. Yeah, that's yeah. But no, I, I I mean, this movie has so many great moments to it. And I think sure. that's one of the things that makes it a Del Toro movie, I think, is, you know, he got this script and, and it's it's sort of like it's a fine script. It's a functional script. It's, it's a David S. Goyer it's script. A, it's a David S. Goyer script. But then <laughs> Del Toro takes it and he finds all these moments to to let it to let the character interactions breathe. To let the to let the horror kind of smolder, you know, yeah, a, yeah. a lot of it, a lot, and a lot of it is silent too, which does make me wonder if like he didn't kind of bend away from what the script strictly said so that he could just kind of make a, an effective horror scene because this is really a horror movie in so many ways. Like, yeah, you've got these people like hunting in the dark, in the dark, terrible, you know, scary, either like either scary old house setting or scary sewer setting. And then you've got these genuinely scary looking monsters um, haunting them. And it's, yeah. it's great. It's great. There's, and, and there's these great moments of just like horrible gore, horrible, sudden shocking gore that um, I, I don't, I don't remember. Yeah. I guess, I guess Del Toro has done that a, a, a bit, but this is by far the most kind of um, visible and, indulgent he's gotten with the gore which is just kind of it's great actually i I love it sure sure yeah and and i don't want to sound like a a broken record with del toro but this is aliens yeah (laughs) this is like uh, even more so than mimic i think i think we we compared mimic unfavorably to aliens a lot Mm -hmm. and i think this is this is round two with del toro and i think he pulls it off obviously it's not as good of a movie as aliens but like Aliens is to Alien as Blade Two is to Blade. I think is a perfect comparison because mm-hmm. it's 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 more fun. It's bigger. Um, you've got a, a a broad cast of very specific archetypal characters. Um, even like the scene where they go to the I forget what the name of the the first vampire safe house they go to where the team does it for the first time has this very slow build of tension where they like get in there and they don't really realize everything's how fucked they are at first. And like Del Toro was so purposeful in how he slowly has the, he like, he shows us the reapers and have them, has them slowly hook up on them. And he's got like four different set pieces going on at the same time where Mm -hmm. the the characters are separated and they're slowly being hunted and it just escalates and escalates and escalates until it explodes into this very long action sequence. Um, That was wonderful. And that's so aliens too. It reminded me of the first time the Marines go down to, to look for the colonists and they just get fucking wiped out mm-hmm. by, by the aliens. Yeah. That's a great point because in, in the same exact way uh, you have, you know, the movie has convinced you that these, um, these vampires are the ultimate badasses mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, uh, and, and that they're just going to wait in there and take out these reapers who, who really don't look like all that. Right. And, yeah. you know, what we get, you know, they, they walk into the club with that song playing in slow motion and it's just the most <laughs> 2002 scene ever. Yes. Um, and then once they get inside, you be, you, you realize, oh, okay, the Reapers aren't vulnerable to their weapons. And the Reapers also appear to be like stronger than they are. And, and like, and so it really does turn the tables and, and turn it from an action movie into a horror movie in that, in that way that aliens does. And I think yeah. Del Toro really does pull that off. Like, so, so as I was watching this, to be honest, the first 10 minutes of this movie, I was like, Oh no, this is going to be just like Chronicles of Riddick where it just doesn't hold up and I and I end up not liking it and I was like I think I was already sending you like snarky texts like 10 minutes in like oh Scott yeah. this is oh my god. I was like making fun of of how the fight goes in the beginning where like a vampire attacks blade with like a a baseball bat and I'm like okay. <laughs> there's no 
the blade has weapons that make you explode if they even nick you and you have a baseball bat. Okay, okay, yeah. Bro. Well, I think like in retrospect, I think that's such a fascinating choice yeah. to have that initial action, action sequence. Um, well, I mean, first of all, we have the opening sequence, which is, I think, after having watched both movies in rapid succession, I think is intentionally calling back to the first movie. We have this opening sequence in blade one, which is the one that I think about. Like that's the thing I think about with blade is when they go into the safe house club scene and then the water or yeah. the blood starts blood spraying out of the sprinklers. Yeah. Yeah. It's such an, it's like the, mo- like the problem, the only critique of blade one I'll have is that the best scene in the movie is over 10 minutes into the movie. <laughs> and, uh-huh. and it just, it just kind of goes downhill from there. Um, which is yeah. like, I still enjoy the movie, but like, that's such an iconic, like wonderfully shot sequence. And I think they were trying to do something similar with that, with the, with the, uh, the Nomax scene where like, you think, you think he's being hunted. Like they're going right. to a blood bank. It's so obvious that he's about to get fucked. And then they turn, they turn the tables on you once again. Um, and it, it, like, it's such a, like when you don't know the movie, no, the guy opens his vagina mouth and then starts talking about how he hates vampires. And you're like, wait, wait wait yeah uh it's a very good sequence but yeah then we cut into like our our quick remind you of what the plot of blade one was scene and then we have wesley snipes just getting to be a badass for five minutes yeah but it does it does kind of like you you start to think okay how's there going to be any tension in this film because he's so fucking good at killing vampires yeah. <laughs> like it's just it's so effortless for him he just kills all these people like they're nothing and so it was like it was a really actually structurally smart thing to do to establish that and then completely completely remove that ability from him because you just have vamps that don't die in those ways yeah it's much harder to fight yeah you inject tension like within his team that mm-hmm. you have to care about because again the stakes should never just be is is hero punching man going to win yeah it should it should be about relationships and like you're kind of you're kind of invested in your you know his relationship with whistler his his interactions with the vampire princess who who he kind of takes a liking to and yeah yeah i mean you're even you're even kind of into like i i I love i I love i did i had completely forgotten about the character of scud i had completely forgotten about that over the years definitely i didn't i didn't know it was norman reedus that's for sure yeah and i love i love i mean i laugh i laughed so many times in this movie but i think the biggest one might have been when blade blows him up after he turns traitor and chris christopherson just goes oh just starting to like him (laughs) 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 because you're like yeah me too oh well (laughs) yeah yeah uh that was such a good it was such a good call. I mean, like if, if you really want to dive into it, analyze like the blade knew he was a traitor the whole time yet waits for his bomb to fail to blow uh-huh. up the vampire guy just so he can get a get a, a very um, a, amazing blow up of Scud, like uh-huh. a, a, a karmic response to Scud. Like uh-huh. that doesn't make a lot of sense, but yeah. half of what Blade does is for style anyway. So it like doesn't matter. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think, I think this movie mines a lot of the drama out of those relationships. I mean, one of the things we've talked about throughout the del Toro stuff is how much he's invested into these familial relationships. Right. And I mm-hmm. think bringing back the Whistler character was such a smart decision because they kind of killed him at the end yeah. of the first one. Um, and, and they kind of retconned it to be like, oh no, he wasn't dead. He was a vampire. And then we just kind of wipe that slate clean. Right. It's yeah. like, we have to quick, we have to make him a vampire, but then we have to cure him of his vampirism really quick. So, so, cause we don't want to worry about that, but also they did kind of worry about it. Right. Cause there is this ongoing tension, um, yeah. in the movie where Scud is trying to get you to mistrust Whistler and, yeah. At first, you just kind of buy into it because you're like, yeah, he's right. Whistler's acting a little weird. But then you, by the end, you realize it's just because Scud is a traitor. Mm-hmm. Um, but so there's that whole father-son relationship between Blade and Whistler. And I think that pairs very well with the whole father-son relationship between Nomak and uh, whoever. The, I forgot the name of his uh-huh. dad, but yeah. the, the, the main old vampire guy. Yeah. Um, there's this interesting father-son dynamic and i guess my one critique of the script and i I don't blame del toro for this but i think they could have leaned into that that juxtaposition a little bit more um like i think it's there in the subtext but the movie doesn't spend a lot of time on it like it it would be this really wonderful juxtaposition with with blade and and if if blade and whistler's relationship as father and son was more central to the plot and Mm -hmm. it just really wasn't you know um yeah i I would have liked it better if they had they had centralized that a bit more 
Yeah, no, I mean, this is one of the things that where I'll just say like it's not a it's not a great film. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it does what it can. It finds these these quiet moments of character mm-hmm. between these ridiculous action set pieces, and that's it's fine. It's 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 good even. Um, but but no, it doesn't make it doesn't really bring you to the point where you can say like oh I felt something yeah. powerful. Um, no, you you didn't. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, I mean, I think. In, like on an emotional level, the way that it works the best for me is almost as a funny movie. Sure. Um, Cause even when I was a kid and, and I'll talk, I'm, I'll talk now about my favorite moment when I was a kid and favorite moment when I was an adult, which, which when I saw, when I saw this, I'd forgotten about it. And I instantly felt 15 years just melt off of my body and mind. And I was, I was rejuvenated. Um, <laughs> it's when, when blade is, you know, he's just kicked the asses of 50 men and killed the, you know, the the vampire antagonist and he's gonna he's moving on to go fight no mac and and whistler goes blade and he throws him something you know what's it gonna be what's he throwing him it's his sunglasses (laughs) and he just catches the sunglasses without looking out of the air puts them on and then and then continues and it's and it and i it cracked me up exactly the same way now as it did back then and that's the thing the movie knows exactly what it's doing yeah um, Wesley Snipes knows exactly what he's doing where he will you know like mug for the camera in, in some of these shots you know oh yeah the just just uh, indulgent in the best possible way fully aware that it's doing that and that oh yeah you know you're you're enjoying it along with you know the the movie if if you, if you will oh 100% you you're, you're totally right there it's a wonderful scene I cracked up laughing it's so absurd it's it's so absolutely absurd and it is it is calling back to a scene from blade i think that's one of the, the interesting things this movie's doing as a sequel is it's also referencing itself um and and i i have not read a single word of a blade comic book right so i have no idea if this is the tone if this is the feel of the comics but i don't care because it it works so well here you know absolutely yeah yeah, um, I guess I, I want to talk about the action sequences because I do think this is something that Del Toro has not done a lot of uh, yet, but I think he does very w- well with the action sequences here. I mean, I think when when we first meet uh, Nissa, I think is the name of the princess vampire, um, her her fight sequence with Blade is done in this this giant room with floor to ceiling fluorescent lights. Um, and so the entire s- sequence is done like on one side of the fluorescent f- fluorescent lights. And so you have like this bright white light on one side, then you have this creepy blue light, light on the other side. And it just really accentuates the uh, the choreography of that fight, which I think is some of the best choreography in the movie. Um, Donnie Yen, who plays one of the vampires, he plays the vampire snowman, who I think I think he's the one that gets horribly killed by light hammer. <laughs> because no Mm -hmm. one notices he turned um he choreographed the whole movie and he's very very good a martial arts choreographer and it looks it like this this movie like the action is like a hong kong-esque type of martial arts movie at times Mm -hmm. um and and this this initial fight like the sword fight between blade and nissa uh is really where the movie accentuates that and i think it's just a a riveting action set set piece i was like look like the the dynamism of it because of the color because of the stark colors happening here i just thought were beautiful yeah i thought that was actually probably the most del toro um scene yeah yeah. to me and and part of it is because the the way um they look like the two vampires that attack him there uh they're wearing these masks that really really remind me of um hellboy aesthetic for some reason (laughs) Yeah, no, trying I think to remember that. exactly. I think I think it's because of the creepy mask uh, guy in Hellboy, who's like a cyborg. But yeah, any, anyway, like yeah, it, it very much reminded me of Hellboy. Um, a, a lot of the shots, even where you've got like the creepy, just just the sort of they're shot in order to make them creepier and scarier in a way that I can't necessarily even describe. Like there's this sort of thing he does where he'll he'll kind of zoom in on their faces even though they're wearing masks, I, I don't know. I, I don't know why or how that works exactly, but it's a thing that I, that I notice of his. Um, yeah. Well, what, I mean, one of the things it does is that like they're wearing this mask and they also have these goggles that like switch over when the UV mm-hmm. light comes on. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that, and those, those zoom ins really accentuate that. 
Um, the, the sounds they make too. They make this creepy, flickery, fluttery sound that mm-hmm. that now now that I'm thinking about it is is a bit. Rem- it does. It's not that it sounds like the mimic sound, the the clicking sound, but it does. It it does kind of accentuate to me how much Del Toro loves his his sounds. He just mm-hmm. he really understands and and even leans on how vital it can be to have an unsettling sound to you know underscore a uh, a moment sure um, yeah because because yeah like those like you find out that those are just a couple of vampires who end up becoming you know major characters in the movie but at that time you you find them unnerving and unsettling and part of that i think is um the way they move and also the the sounds that they're making so. yeah yeah well and i mean i loved like I, I loved the inclusion of that because like i said we were just leaving this badass blade action set set piece where he just kills everyone and mm-hmm. then these two things that you don't even know they're vampires yet appear and they just they, they, he's totally evenly matched in fact mm-hmm. i mean that's that's how that fight ends right they both they both are have swords at each other's neck like he's completely evenly matched by this woman mm-hmm. um and you're like holy shit this is blade this is badass mm-hmm. and and so it really does set the stage for the cooperation sequence and and maybe helps helps you understand why blade would agree to this obvious trap that these vampires are setting for him Mm -hmm. yeah because he's he's fascinated by it right yeah yeah and uh it 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 works it works well enough right yeah yeah um that was a great scene i mean the 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 big the big fights toward the end of the movie you know the, the the uh the fight with nomak at the end is it, it probably has too much of the switching back and forth between CGI, but honestly, yeah, like I, I like I said, I remember it being so much more hilariously jarring and, and bad than it actually was. I don't know what's wrong with me now, <laughs> um, but like I was watching, I was like, yeah, I mean, you can you can tell that that's CGI because a person can't do that, but other than that, I'm willing to overlook certain things. I guess I don't know. Like it, it, it was fine. I thought it was a. It was a good, it was a good violent brawl, right? Yeah, I mean, I think the CGI switch works better on Nomak because he's so unhuman already, mm-hmm. you know. Like, so it's much more believable to understand that this this Reaper vampire moves th- in this kind of unnatural, floaty kind of way. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the part th- that part didn't bother me as much. The part would have it really bothered me was in the original se- sequence when he's fighting Nyssa in front of the lights when it switches because there's just a whole like combination there where it's just CG mm-hmm. and it's yeah. just like I just like ugh, why'd you do that <laughs> why'd you yeah. do it that way his like, body moves like a jellyfish it's just yeah not even close. yeah 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 I'm I, I have a stupid plot question like sure like how old is Nomak supposed to be I don't know that see like Honestly, when I remembered the movie, when I saw Nomak and I remembered this is the Vagina Face vampire movie, um, my, my the only thing I remembered was Nomak was his son, mm-hmm. uh, the the main bad guy's son, and so I was like, okay, so what I, what I my brain did was just assume that he tested he experimented on an already existing son and, and turned him into this, but that doesn't end up being what it is. Is like his son was a test tube baby reaper just like all the other ones we see in the the little column of of fetuses near the end um so i don't know i mean you 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 maybe assume that they were like they're genetically engineered to grow quicker i I don't know i i don't i don't think the movie does a good job of of making that clear because it's clear that nissa had no idea that this was her brother yeah and i mean the only thing i can think of that would make sense is like for some reason he has a son who he it's a genetically engineered son first of all it's not even like yeah. a pure son and then raises him in secret and i guess feeds him blood regularly but never actually lets him infect anyone for you know 20 years or 30 years or whatever yeah and and then and then somehow he escapes and then he's going to get revenge but like it's it's interesting cuz to me it almost seems like a missed opportunity to say like hey this this poor guy was actually like treated like shit for, for his entire life. And I mean, obviously spreading this horrible virus, which is more, more, you know, almost more like a zombie plague um, than a vampire plague. Right. Mm-hmm. Because it, it, actually it's kind of a fun, it's kind of a fun trope game he's playing because these things end <laughs> up behaving like zombies right there. Sure. They, they, they're after blood um, and they have a weakness to sunlight, but they, 
they're they're just kind of a mindless uh ravening force um, but yeah. anyway like like that's you don't it it, it seems I, yeah i don't know i i think the reason i fixate on this is i feel like there's something i'm missing because nomak like he has this like i actually kind of think the actor has like a cool way of speaking that just makes me intrigued by this character mm-hmm. and you're like okay where 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 does this guy come from who is he like what is his what is his past what is motivating yeah. him and, and there's it seems like there was the movie sort of gestures that you're supposed to be asking these questions and then never answers them and so i guess that's maybe why i feel like i'm i'm fixated on it i do think this is one of the places in the movie that i think it is most apparent uh, about what you were talking about earlier where this is a this is an okay script that del toro is attempting to pull more out of it that is there mm-hmm. the, the character of nomak feels like a character that in the script is very underwritten that del toro like pulled really interesting stuff out of him mm-hmm. and i think it goes back to the type of things that that del toro was most interested in right del toro was most interested in taking the monster character and making him tragic right like the vampire in chronos uh the ghost in in the devil's backbone uh maybe not the mimics monster so much in uh-huh. mimic but there is like there is a reading of that thing there's like these things were genetically engineered like they, they didn't ask to be created like you right. made this thing you created this monster and now you're trying to kill it and and that's the same thing here right this is nomak didn't ask to be created and and he was there is there is something in the movie, the way Del Toro shoots him, the the tone of the film around Nomak builds him up to be this tragic character where, yes, you understand that our hero has to kill him by the end of the movie. He has to. He's he's a plague that that could infect the entire world. But there is something very tragic about it. And, and I do not think in the script what happens is Nomak pushes the sword in the final bit himself right yeah. because that's that's what del toro does that's a del toroism to me mm-hmm. that blade fights him blade wins but he's not dead yet and then nomak says okay i am going to kill myself i'm mm-hmm. going to do the last blow to myself that is guillermo del toro and so i think what you what you're like picking at here what you're gesturing at here is something that that wasn't just not in the script mm-hmm. and and del toro is is a, a good enough director that he can kind of wink and and nudge at these things and use all the tools that he has in his tool belt um, to to bring them to the surface without the script actually referencing them directly. I like that a lot. I like this idea that um, you know there there could be a, a alternate universe version of this movie where the character of Nomak is just is just kind of an uninteresting, monstrous, uh, uh, you know. Uh, sort of arbitrary mm-hmm. character, and 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 I think that a combination of the actor and uh, Del, probably Del Toro's, you know, telling the actor like, "Look, this is who your character is. This is what I want from you here," uh, is what makes him into to, to me sort of the the most interesting thing happening in the movie is this character. I, I I've looked up this actor because I'm like, why? Like, I, I think this actor does does a great job, you know, being this kind of yes, yeah, slightly over the top, but you know conveying a proper amount of pathos uh through this character and he's just he's never been in anything that that you would have ever seen but he's been in a ton of movies in his career it's kind of mm-hmm. interesting it's kind of interesting because he has a very full acting resume it's just literally zero movies that i've seen uh, ex- <laughs> except for this one um but uh yeah i don't know that's that's a th- th- i think you're exactly right to point out that emphasizing the tragic and cursed nature of of the of the misfit the outsider the monster is absolutely um, what Del Toro is interested in, which I think is maybe part of part of the reason why Blade, it, he just is a bad. He just is kind of the silent badass the whole movie, right? Yeah, he doesn't just he just doesn't have a lot to do in this movie. Yeah. Like the movie's not really about him. No, <laughs> no, he just gets to be the badass force of nature who 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 you know wins. He just sure yeah, sure. It, there's there's very little very little pathos involved in Blade. I mean the fir- the first movie. Uh, messes with him as a character a lot more than this one does. Yeah, for sure. yeah. I mean, his his constant struggle with like his need to feed, um, mm-hmm. and like the I, I, the thing I loved about the first movie was the idea that like he's been taking the serum since Whistler found him that's been keeping his blood lust under control, but it's starting to wear off, and 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 it started he's starting to build an immunity to it, and there's this wonderful scene where um the 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 female lead in that character whose name I'm completely blanking on right now, which shows that maybe she's a little underwritten unfairly in that movie because i can't remember her name but um she offers him a cure right she says i've discovered the cure 
but you will lose your strength, your speed, your ability to heal. And he chooses not to do it because mm -hmm. he chooses to be the guy that that is going to live with the the negative effects of, of this thing because he wants to do good and he wants to defeat these people mm -hmm. and he wants to kill all the vampires. That's like his goal. So that that is a very interesting turn. And the, and one of the most interesting things that the character does in this entire series. And there's really nothing like that in this movie at all. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, exactly. There's, there's no struggle. There's just... Yeah. There's just moments where he's been set up to kick a bunch of ass. Yep. Yep. Uh, which is which is what you want out of this movie. That's that's the thing is um I, I don't know if I fully finished the thought earlier, but like the first 10 minutes of the movie, I was like, oh no, I've this movie actually sucks. And then and then like you 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 click over into being like, okay, I I get what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. It's we're just we're having fun and it's gonna be scary and fun and bloody and violent and um and there's enough going on with the characters that you're into it and then that's that's fine it just propels itself on, sure, on that sure. um yeah there's there's so many um it's funny because i'm looking over my notes and like all almost all my notes have to do with the visual aspects of, of things like just so many moments that i think of as being classical del toro like uh uh you know the the guy the first guy who gets bitten by the re reapers and he's turning into one of them and somebody like cuts off you know a quarter of his head yeah and then they burn up his body with sunlight um and then the the head piece is just like sitting there and you can see like the exposed brain and the eyes blinking because it's still alive because it's so good and it's like so upsetting and unnerving and, and great yeah it's such and, it, and again that's an, that's another type of thing where it's like i don't know if that was in the script right like that's mm -hmm. I, I would bet I would bet that it wasn't actually. I'll put it that way. Yeah. Because it's so it's so like like his his kind of disturbing vision of things. And he's always into like eyes, eyes being where they shouldn't be. <laughs> that's that's a big thing for him. Um yeah. so yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess we can talk about like we've we've said vagina vampire like seven times. At least I have um, yeah. throughout the show. But I mean the design of the reaper is uh -huh. it's so del toro but it's also so cool like it's just yeah. I, I love i love that the choice to make the 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 line in the neck just appear there always uh -huh. um and then just separate like when the thing g gets ready to eat and then it's got the tentacly tongue uh -huh. it's just it's so deliciously disturbing and otherworldly um it, it turns a vampire like which is like so many times and even even in the original blade movie vampires are depicted as it's it's kind of this romantic sex analog right like being yeah. bitten by a vampire is is akin to having sex and it turns that from a, a, a romantic like i'm going to woo you and then suck your blood thing into this violent disgusting act that i just i, I it's such a great elevation of that i it's, it's a re wonderful design really good touch like you know you know del toro sat with that design for months before he was found one he was perfectly happy with yeah it's very alien it's mm -hmm. it's very um viscerally gross like it's funny because because the the predator also often gets called vagina mouth because yeah, that's yeah. kind of, kind of the, the idea there. But like this is far more upsetting and gross and um like invasive feeling because it's mm -hmm. the point of it is to grab onto you and bite you. I mean it's a vag vagina dentata basically, right? Yeah. Um, you know it injects you with poison, it injects you with literal disease actually, which is yeah another another level there. Um. Uh, and then it turns you into one of them, which is, you know, the, the, that's already the vampire thing, but it's, it's worse here. Um, and it yeah. makes, it makes you, makes you mindless, right? That's yeah. yeah. That's another thing. I, I wish they played with the idea of the vampires finally, like suddenly being hunted and, and knowing what it's like, right? Like I wish there was more drama surrounding that. There really just there was one kind of gesture towards it where I think Whistler says like they're just they're just mad that they're not on the top of the food chain anymore. But I, I do wish the movie allowed us to sit with this this concept of of a, a, a predator species suddenly finding yeah. that they are prey. Right. That that's that's really interesting. Yeah. I mean, maybe that's a different movie though. I think, I think that becomes I, a completely different. Movie. I think that becomes a much more serious movie. I mean, it, yeah. and it, I agree. Like it becomes frustrating sometimes because the movie introduces this idea of pure bloods, and, and you feel like that was something that the movie wanted to do something with, and then like, yeah, like forgot because the idea is like if you're if you're if both of your parents are 
are vampires, then you are a pure blood. Mm-hmm. And that means, I mean, and, and this is all me. This is all me. This, the movie doesn't say any of this, but it's like, well, if you're raised as a vampire, then you, then you, your thirst has always just been normal to you, and humans have always been cattle to you, and your, and mm-hmm. your whole social structure has told you, like, yeah, you're, you know, humans are cattle. That's what they're for. But like, any person who is bitten by a vampire and becomes a vampire that way, um, they're gonna have some really mixed feelings about this whole vampire thing, right? They're going (laughs) to like, like they're going to have the thirst, you know, it's almost a Stephen King thing uh, uh, where it's like, you know, they'd probably end up indulging themselves and then having to find a way to justify it. Right. But it's not like, it's not like the vampire virus just makes you evil immediately. Mm -hmm. Or, or, Or maybe it does. I don't know. The movie, again, the movie doesn't really tell us the answers to these things, but like, I find the idea way more interesting if like there there there's a subclass of vampires who are actually really kind of tormented about being vampires, um, but the sure, movie doesn't sure. want to go there at all. Obviously, that's not this, yeah. that's not this movie. Blade One went into the whole pure blood versus mixed blood thing mm-hmm. um, because our Frost, our our antagonist, was a not was not a pure blood, and and there the the metaphor was just stretched to be like the the old aristocracies versus like the new young hip vampire thing so Mm -hmm. they didn't they didn't explore it in that direction very much but there i mean there are moments in this movie that kind of hint towards it like i just remember when they go into the the club reinhardt is like talking about how he wishes he could just kill every single person here because none of these vampires here are purebloods Mm -hmm. they're all like all the ones here are are the the mongrel kind Mm -hmm. and and that's just like like a, a line that's thrown into the movie where you're like whoa and then it just kind of drops it and and doesn't really ever come back to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, I guess I guess if you squint, you could argue that 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 is a lineup of what the what the I don't know his name, the grandpa daddy vampire like is trying to do is that he's like trying to genetically engineer them their pure bloods to even pure purer blood right. Mm-hmm. So like that's a hint that these people are like are of a certain. Um, like eugenics type of of belief system but again it just doesn't that's not what the movie's really about so it's just kind of winks at it and then moves on yeah i mean you could even say like the the uh can you blush line being potentially a racist thing yeah i d- i honestly did not get that outside of just he's being racist to him at, like uh, I was like, oh, is are these Nazi vampires? <laughs> is yeah, that, is I, that, that was what I. That's the only thing, and I was like, I don't, I don't get it. And it's confusing because they're not white. Um, yeah, but but that guy was. Yeah, and and the thing is, like, okay, so I I thought about this, and I was like, well, okay, is it that potentially like if you're not drinking blood, then you don't have any blood in your body, and the and thus you can't blush. But like, it's totally also a racist thing. Yes. Yes. So, so like, are we bring like what? Where does this race commentary fit in here? I I feel like I feel like these things are all kind of there, like they were thrown in there, and then it was, and then not developed. You know? Yeah, that feels like <laughs> I, I I feel bad for continuing to bag on him, but that's such a David S. Goyer thing <laughs> where he just throws shit in and it's not really developed. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. Well. <laughs> yeah, because you know, I I I thought about it, and then I googled like, what is the what is the can you blush thing? And and like mm-hmm. the internet appeared to be split between something to do with vampirism and just being a racist remark. Yeah. Um, and I was like, yeah, I, I, it's so baffling. And then it comes back again later in the movie and you're like, I don't, yeah, I don't understand what, what doesn't blade say it back to Reinhardt. Blade says it back to him. Like, <laughs> it's like, you're like, what, okay. what does that mean? Okay. Whatever. <laughs> you killed him. So yeah. it was, it was yeah. fun. Yeah. yeah. Uh, speaking of, of Reinhardt, Ron Perlman, is just really good in this movie. I mean, yeah. we're, we're already seeing that Guillermo del Toro is the type of director that likes to take people with him, right? Like, I think basically since his first movie, every one of his movies has either wanted to or brought back a, uh, an actor into it. Um, I mean, even this one, like Norman Reedus, we talked about it during Mimic, plays like a like a two minute bit role in that movie, and I guess del Toro liked him in that that one day shot he had and brought him back for the scud character. And of course, Ron Perlman, he loves and he loved in Kronos and he brings him back here. And, and this is not the last we're going to see of Ron Perlman in the, in the del Toro filmography. So yes, um, he's, he's, he's a really great despicable character here. I like him. He, unlike Wesley Snipes, 
Ron Perlman's character wears sunglasses the entire movie. We never see his eyes. He's always wearing sunglasses. Uh-huh. Um, and he's he's a perfect kind of, I don't want to say foil, but I guess kind of, right? He's like the the stoic badass of that team. Yeah. Um, who is just kind of the same character. Yeah. And like, yeah, I mean, he's sort of likable in his hateability, right? He's, sure, he's, sure. Like, I, I like the moment where he's messing around with Blade's sword and you see that he's sort of figured out like the the booby trap in mm-hmm. it right like like he's actually competent um it's just not competent enough like not as competent mm-hmm. as he thinks he is and, and blade is constantly just like slightly one-upping him right so yeah definitely i mean you can even kind of empathize with his frustration because he's you know i trained to kill this guy and yeah two years two years two, he trained to kill him yeah yeah which i mean yeah probably probably could have just shot him from across the street with a I, actually that's this is this is one of my one of my things is i'm like i don't the movie the movie's very unclear as to whether blade can even be killed like how would you i, I mean i guess they they almost killed him by taking all of his blood um yeah but that but other than that like how would you kill this person in combat he can't be harmed by uh by silver or, or garlic or yeah. any of these things so like you you would have to just especially if you're vulnerable to his weapon and he just has to like, nick you with his sword and you explode into a fireball <laughs> like like how how would you how would a vampire kill blade uh, other than shooting him from a distance with a lot of bullets or something it's yeah, just I, it's just funny i feel like me. if you decapitated him he'd probably die right yeah that's true I, maybe if you stabbed him in the heart too but yeah, yeah i think yeah. he'd probably die yeah. yeah um yeah going back to the to the reapers were kind of all over the place but i just wanted to mention i i liked i liked the touch that when they burst into flame they burst blue uh-huh. to the normal vampires orange uh-huh. and it's just like a perfect way of just visually signifying that they're like an elevated like blue flame is hotter than than orange flame so like uh-huh. they're they're an elevated version of vampire like it, it signifies them it makes them unique it's a, it's a clear visual in the the heat of combat that you can tell like when when the guys are just spraying automatic automatic weapon fire and just killing all these vampires like you know okay those are the normal ones not the not the yes. reapers but it also is just it's 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 just a clever design choice i think yeah oh yeah i, I love i love the moment where you know they're they're shooting at the one that's running and they're they're hitting all these vampires who are who are bursting in the flame yeah just like yeah. you said that's a great it's a great idea uh, and along those lines i love it when they dissect the one and, and you see the the organs and how it's like like so obviously unnatural and yeah everything on the inside is like bone plated and then they drop the blood in there and it like gurgles to life it's it's so so good frankensteinian and and upsetting it's great yeah and i love when it's called back to at the end when blade slips the knife in and we just cut to this very brief in interior Mm -hmm. um nomac scene where we see the the knife get up under the bone plate Mm -hmm. um and it's just like i want like every time i see an insert shot like that i wonder like was that in the the first cut or did they have to add that because people missed it? Uh, yeah. I don't know. Cause yeah, I think, yeah, I don't know. That's a good point. Cause the, it's really very brief that they mentioned that like, Oh, you can get at the heart from the side and it, mm-hmm. it'd be easy to forget that. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It, I like enjoyable movie. That's the thing is like, I, I think, I think it is undoubtedly true that Guillermo del Toro took what have could have been a pretty Eh, script and made a a fun movie that i enjoyed watching out of it um yeah because so. this movie did really well like you said um i remember i mean the thing is based on the age i was everybody i knew loved this movie <laughs> <laughs> i'm but, shocked but i'm, I'm shocked. pretty sure that the critics didn't <laughs> yeah i think that's probably um, true yeah i mean I'm, I'm seeing i'm seeing like a like a metacritic of 52 percent uh cinema score of a b plus uh b plus yeah b plus yeah yeah that's pretty bad cinema score though like yeah Rot- rotten cinema tomatoes of 57 percent pretty bad pretty pretty bad overall scores and and that, like I, I get that i'm not i don't i'm not necessarily gonna argue um it's just like for for what it was for me as a teenager and even as an adult i'm able to appreciate what it's doing there's so much there, there are so many moments of it where i'm just like okay this this is just so corny now in 2020 but yeah, yeah. in in 2002 it was legitimately the most badass thing that had ever happened um so at least to a 17 year old so um <laughs> yeah 
Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I like like I said, there are there are if if you had to give me like if you made me give this movie a grade, I think like a a, a solid B minus would probably be a fair a fair critique. I, I think there's a lots of fun parts of it, and there's lots of um, fun things to talk about. But I do I do think there are frustrating moments in the movie where I just I wish I wish the movie had tried to be a little bit more than it was. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and 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 it wasn't mm-hmm. and so it, it makes for a fun time i enjoyed my time with it i don't think blade 2 is going to become another yearly watch a movie that i want to revisit and really pick at like like the devil's backbone was right like that's a movie that i want to watch again and again and again and, and find more things to appreciate in it mm-hmm. and i have just no interest in doing that with this movie mm-hmm. um it might be one of those ones when i'm like doing laundry on a saturday morning and I, if i see it on on tbs i'm like Fuck yeah. Let's, yeah. let's turn on to Blade 2. But that's but that's it. Yeah, I think the final comment from me, I'll, uh, I think you kind of stirred this up by mentioning, you know, rewatch value is like one thing that I did not notice as a youngster and do notice now is how much attention Del Toro pays to the settings, every single setting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there, there are so many different settings. Every setting, every element of it is is thought out to, to you know, serve exactly the purpose that he wants to serve here like you know they're in this club they go to the back area of the club there's you know dark dirty dirty walls and 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 d- dark drapes hanging everywhere and you know the lighting is is this it just it just cultivates this atmosphere and then like five minutes of that and then now you're into sewers or whatever and like it's it's a whole different aesthetic of the sewers and then later on in the movie you're in this high-tech vampire compound which has a whole bunch of kind of uh, distinctive, you know, a lot of glass and metal and catwalks and concrete, like like interesting sort of sloping concrete shapes that that give you this feeling of like incredible s- solidity to the building, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. N- n- nothing is just kind of rote. There's no just like like okay, and then we have a, a room where mm-hmm. there's you know, it's no, it's all it's all you know, even even places where you're only there for a second. It's, yeah. it's going to be thought out and, no, I think and, and perfect. I think you're spot on with that. I mean, it's this it's this beautiful mix of the gothic with the industrial mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. I think we've seen in just about every single one of his movies, mm-hmm. right? That like even even back in Kronos, this was a movie where I think the 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 main hideout of of our bad guy is just this this industrial building like yeah. in a, a like steel factory, mill or right? something yeah, yeah something like, like that and yet there is this this gothic feel to it with the statues hanging and the and the the, the way he uses shadows and darkness and that's continued like the the subway system in mimic is this beautiful like it, it's it's it, it's like industrial it's like this is a, an old subway yard but but it's old and and like you've got mm-hmm. the 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 stone the like it looks like you could stick a gargoyle on some of these stone outcrops and yeah. it'd be perfect there yeah and it's just yeah it's 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 his aesthetic he really 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 loves it and he likes to put it everywhere he can and i think he picks movies specifically because they have the opportunity to do this i mean i i just wonder what this movie would look like without that dotoro touch i guess we know because blade is just not that like Mm -hmm. there, there are interesting set pieces in blade, but it's not this, this attention to detail that you're talking about this, this marrying of these two different kinds of aesthetics to create something that feels unique and purposeful and, and, and and sticks in your memory. Mm -hmm. Um, Although it didn't in mind at the time, but perhaps it will now. Yeah. Right. I, I, again, I haven't seen blade in forever and I don't want to be too unfair to it, but I, I think it's it's just like the thing is that in in every Del Toro movie we've seen up till now, every setting, every you could even say every shot has this composed quality to it in terms yeah. of you know every every detail of what's in the shot, every detail of the lighting and, and the character and, and the way the character is outfitted and and just everything about it. Um, and that's I think that's you know when people talk about del toro they tend to talk about his visual style and it's becoming you know as we watch more of these movies it's becoming more clear to me what exactly that means and and, you know why he's so famous for that Mm -hmm. um it's funny because i still can't necessarily pinpoint what you know what is del toro's visual style but like i think what you said there kind of a mix of of the gothic and the and the industrial yet run down is a big part of it yeah yeah Um, i I think so and i think 
um, no spoilers for movies you haven't seen yet, but this mixture of industry and gothic is definitely something we're going to continue to see. I mean, you've seen Hellboy. It's yeah. kind of a perfect mix of those two things, right? Yeah. It's this, it's this, this supernatural mixed with this kind of steampunky, uh, futurist stuff. Like, yeah. it's Hellboy yeah, is steampunky so very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. God, I can't wait to talk about Hellboy. Mm-hmm. And and why the new Hellboy that came out was so damn awful. I'm going to work that into the conversation about yeah, Hellboy. I have no desire to watch that. So. Final question. Is a mm-hmm. reaver a kind of bug? <laughs> For consistency's sake, we have to say yes. Yeah, I think so. It's a bug. It's just yeah. a vampire bug. It's a vampire bug. Yeah. So that's we got it. We got a vampire bug in Kronos. Mm-hmm. We got uh, a bug bug in Mimic. We mm-hmm. got... Uh, a, a reference to we got slugs we got slugs <laughs> i know they're not bugs but we're gonna count it we got slugs in devil's backbone this is how slow my brain is is i just realized that this is in fact his second vampire movie yeah yeah um yeah huh okay cool he likes he likes the vampire clearly not the same kind of vampire but uh yeah um, he does like the vampire no. but they're both tragic kind of frankenstein monsters in both mm-hmm. of these movies these vampires yeah i mean damaskinos even kind of looks like um the way our you know marble marbleized vampires looked like in chronos is that his name yeah oh there we go i was calling him old daddy vampire the old, whole time. old daddy vampire and you, just, and you just knew his name the no, whole no, time no. i looked it up okay <laughs> fair, <laughs> fair. all right uh anything else to say about blade 2 i don't think so if you were sliding this, if we were putting these movies in order uh, from best to worst, where would you put it? Oh, that's not fair, Scott. <laughs> because young Matt loved this movie. But, I mean, this is not a very good film. It's It looks really nice and it's fun. But I think that if you were, if you were like, what is a good representative Del Toro movie? I would not, I would put this at the bottom of that list. I, I mean, I'd put it above Mimic. Okay. <laughs> I would put it, okay, I think I'd put it above Mimic. I agree. I agree with that. Yeah. Sorry, I forgot about Mimic for a second. It's okay. It's okay to forget about Mimic. Del Toro <laughs> wishes you would forget about Mimic. Okay, good. I feel better now. Well, that is it for Blade 2, uh, the next Deconstructing Del Toro we will be doing in the year 2021. We'll be taking a look at Hellboy, the first Hellboy movie. So that'll be in a few weeks from now when we will pick up the Del Toro deconstruction once again. Do, 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 do. Okay, Matt, before we go for the week, you wanted to talk about this, uh, this, this video game. The, you, you're just such a gamer over here uh-huh. these days. Yeah. Tell me about I'm Cyberpunk. I'm trying to expand my, my, uh, my tastes. Uh, yeah, so I got Cyberpunk 2077. So before you, before you tell us how you feel about it, Pretend I don't know what Cyberpunk is. What is Cyberpunk 2077? So, I mean, on the meta level, it's this game that that this studio has been working on for like nine years. And so it's got this huge amount of like hype and expectation built up behind it. And apparently it's been having all sorts of problems, which is, I guess, why it's taken so long. Um, but, it, you know, it, it, there was all this promise that it was going to be this unprecedented open world uh, just you know, with a with a never before seen degree of of you know size and depth to the open world experience. Like you've got this whole city that you can move around in and interact with everyone in the city, mm-hmm. and um, and so and it ends, and what it is actually is you know it's it's a it's a it's a first person um, open world, very much like Grand Theft Auto. To be honest, is how it works in execution, where you're driving around a city and then there's a bunch of missions you can do for different people and. And it uses a lot of the same systems that have become very standard in the Grand Theft Auto type games. Um, yeah, but it's in a cyberpunk future where you 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 know you you get augments. It's actually very much like Deus Ex in that way. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. Uh, I mean, Deus Ex is a is a great a great classic game. It's one of those things that was just like way ahead of its time. And I I played it back in the day, and and like this this game really. Uh, uses a lot of those ideas. I mean, a lot of games since then have also used those ideas. Sure, um, sure. But um, but in terms of so so yeah, that was that's what the game is. Uh, uh, so so my feelings about the game is that I think like the fir- the first day that I played it, I played it for a few hours the first day, and I think I had a good impression after that. I was like, okay, I'm 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 getting into the story. The combat seems kind of fun, 
um, I, I, at the time I was like, the combat seems fun, but I haven't earned any of the like abilities yet. And so it just, it's basically just shooting people. Um, and then like on the second day I encountered my first catastrophic glitch that made me have to reload from a, from a save, uh, because a guy who I needed to get a key card from had warped through a wall. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, this is pretty, that like, this is pretty bad. This is pretty like unforgivable for a game of this caliber that, that like I, I couldn't have progressed with the story if I hadn't gotten that key card. Like it was, a, mm-hmm. it was very critical. Um, and, uh, and then other than that, there's just a lot of glitchiness and kind of um, issues with like the character animations. There's a kind of uncanny valiness to the, to the character animations, which, you know, one might say, oh, come on, Matt, all these games have have uncanny valiness to them. And I, and I would say, like, actually, you know, we played uh, Soma the other day, a few, few months ago. Um, that that game was made in 2015, and I didn't feel this kind of jarring, uh, weird like like you know alienness from the from the character animations. There, been playing God of War 2018 a lot, and that that game is is like perfect as far as I'm concerned. This game like like it's just it, it's off putting in that way. And then the combat, like the more I played it, the worse the combat got actually. So on the whole, I've just been like increasingly disappointed, and I'm at the point where I've only really played it for maybe. I don't know, seven hours or something, and I'm just not likely to play it anymore. Maybe that's a lot. Mm-hmm. I don't know. But like I got some level of enjoyment, but it's kind of like built up. I've kind of like accrued complaints and annoyances while simultaneously like losing a sense of investment in the story to the point where I'm just kind of like, ah, I think I'm okay. I don't yeah. know. Maybe I'll push myself to play it a bit more because I did buy it. Maybe I'll change my mind. I know Michael played it, and I think he liked it a lot more than I did. Um, but uh, and maybe we can have him on to talk about his opinion. But uh, yeah, I'm not enjoying it very much, to be honest. Yeah, that's really disappointing. I mean, I have not played the game yet because I'm in the middle of moving and just do not have time for video games right now. But it was definitely on my want to buy list, um, and and I've been listening to the complaints and and the 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 huge issues it's having and it's i think it's interesting that these are almost two separate issues like issue number one is that the game is busted and not clearly not ready for launch i mean Mm -hmm. i think right before we got on to record it was announced that sony has pulled it from the playstation store so i could not if i wanted to play it on a playstation i couldn't right now because it's been pulled um and they're they're offering refunds to anyone who bought it through the playstation store which Mm -hmm. is just insane it's absolutely insane um i i've been i've been shown and told that on the last generation of consoles on the ps4 and xbox one it is basically literally unplayable that just like the textures take 20 seconds to pop in when you Mm -hmm. move to a new area like it's just like fundamentally broken Mm -hmm. and and that's a bummer but that's like a bummer where you can be like okay well maybe they can patch that out you know in in a couple Mm -hmm. months like three four months they they give some time they patch out those issues and the game becomes playable. But yeah, I mean, it seems like from what you said and from what I've seen elsewhere that there's, there's another problem is that the game is just not very good (laughs) outside of the, outside of the technical issues it's having that it's just kind of ho-hum. And, and like, I, I have this thing where I am so sick of the open world model of gameplay, like it's specifically the Ubisoft model, which I don't know if this is like, shoring very close to that i mean even the grand theft auto model i'm just kind of like it just ends up being a lot of just time spent driving between missions Mm -hmm. where like you're just like you're just sitting there wait like dry like yeah and and there's there are moments where that can be fun for sure but i don't know it just seems like a lot of empty open wasted space yeah so you could put the word the words open world on your video game it is i mean i i agree like here, here's the thing I've, I've been playing a ton of god of war um more more than i played any game in many many years actually yeah and i just you think, love you love this fucking I, I, game i it's... fucking love this game this game is so good and here's here's the thing about it like i i don't know if people call it open world or not but the thing is like it it does have this thing where you know there are different missions that you can do they're like optional missions that you can do to earn money and experience and, 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 you know, power ups and stuff like that. You can move around the world. You can even go between the worlds. It's, it's very fun. Very cool idea. And 
I play this game for a ridiculous number of hours and I never actually get tired of any aspect of it. Like the combat is always challenging and fresh. Even if you've, even if you're like really good at the combat, there's always like another level of challenge you can push yourself to, to like be just Mm -hmm. a little bit better. Um, Moving around, like if, if you're on the boat moving around, the characters will tell each other stories and have character interactions and you're into their characters. And so you care about that because you've got a, minor spoilers, I guess, like you've got your son with you and then you've got a head hanging off your belt who tells you stories. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and both. And, and so like, there's, there's always three characters, right? No matter what. Um, and so like all of that makes it so that you're never, you're never like, ah, you know, you're ne- like, like, at no at no point in the game, even after you've beaten the game and you're just going around doing the side missions, you're you're still having fun basically. Sure. And this game, like this game, and and I agree with you when when just like the same like the same thing for all the Grand Theft Auto games is like you're alone driving a car through a city. It's like okay, that that's fun for twenty minutes. Mm-hmm. Okay, but you're but you're gonna make me do like hours of this. Yeah, like what what what? That's not fun. Where's the, there's no fun here. What's the fun part? Like it, it's the sort of thing where I, I wasn't even playing that long and I already found myself like shooting people randomly just to see what would happen. Right. Because yeah. you're, you, you're just like, I'm, I don't, I don't know what I can and can't do and I don't know what the limits are. So I'm just going to kind of go, go buck wild here. Um, whereas in God of War, it's like, well, that, that's not an option because it's not, it's not, it's not putting you in this weird place where it's yeah. like, oh, it's an open world game, but also only if you stay on this path, it'll yeah. break otherwise. Yeah, and I mean, like, the the whole Grand Theft Auto, like, I'm just going to run up my star amount and, and do this whole big police chase thing. Mm-hmm. When, whenever that would happen, whenever I would do that, it was usually the result of boredom. Like, yeah. like I'm just, like, I'm driving to another mission, and I'm just like, fuck this. There's yeah. a cop car. I'm going to run into it, and then I'm going to make my own fun. And, and yes, you could argue that these these open-world games do have the the ingredients necessary to to kind of build your own fun but i mean that still has an expiration date to it like that gets boring after a while Mm -hmm. like there's only so much you can like outrun the cops before you're like okay i'm done with this now and no game in in this this type of design has really held my attention or really made like there like made me sit back and say yes i understand now i understand the reason you had to make this open world um the only games that have come close to that the the best like open world type design games that I played recently have been uh, the Legend of Zelda game Breath of the Wild and um, another game called Outer Wilds that I've been telling you about for months because yeah. it's like the best gaming experience I've had in a long, long time. And I mean, those are like the thing about those games is like, I mean, the Breath of the Wild open worldness, it, it is a massive, massive world, but it also is like absolutely peppered with constant things to do like the 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 frustrating slash not really frustrating part about that game is like you're heading to waypoint x and then you have 75 things that you stumble upon on your way there Mm -hmm. that like distract you but that's like like a good thing because that's discovery like you feel like you're discovering new things and you're like okay i'm going to go to this giant bird temple thing oh but look there's something down there and look there's something over there and that that feels good and natural and then outer wilds is open world quote unquote but it's the world is it's big but it's also small um like and and the game the whole design philosophy of the game is to explore like that the way the story is doled out to you is via exploration Mm -hmm. um where, where these these ubisoft open world games it's just about putting collectibles like i'm so sick of the assassin's creed games like i'm so sick of them mm-hmm. it's like ride from city a to city b there's like ten thousand feathers on the map that you can collect if you want but really you're just riding from mission to mission and then done game mm-hmm. done yeah yeah i um i think a big part of it is that i'm not invested in like my character sure um and and i think that's yeah, maybe maybe another thing about Breath of the Wild and, and Outer Wilds is like you from from what you've told me, I haven't played either of those uh, really. Is, is like you just you get more invested in it, and so um, that that also helps propel you uh, between yeah. you know you know between kind of story set pieces. Um, whereas, I mean, this game is clearly trying, but I just don't really 
care or or, or like my character um yeah <laughs> uh yeah it's it, such that's... a bummer it's such a bummer so many so many developers have put in so much time on that game and and i mean you could argue that it probably shouldn't have been released in the state it was, but they felt pressure to do so because of all the continuous delays. And I I feel bad for all the developers who are now are going to have to go through like crunch over the holidays to try to get the game into a shape that it'll get back on the PlayStation store. Um, It's just, it's just sad all around, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I I don't even know if they'll be able to fix it. Like, and and I I say it, genuinely just don't know like it's, it seems like they've been struggling for so long to get it to work it's like oh, what is one more month gonna do them i, I don't sure. I, sure I think i mean if i had to guess and i'm completely full of shit here i know nothing about making video games but i i am a programmer so i, I know how like loading loading things works and like <laughs> like like all like the thing about ps4 games in general is that they always have to load areas and then you move to a new area and they have to load the new area right that's sure. it's like a fundamental thing of of of, ga- of games in general, basically, um, and they find clever ways to kind of hide the seams between areas. And the thing about this game is just a massive, massive area, uh, a massive world. And I think they tried. I think they've tried to do some like tricks uh, to to get around the the limitations of of the PS4's ability to hold a giant um, world model. And I think they fucked it up. And I don't think it can be fixed. Like I, I think they fundamentally misunderstood the capabilities of what they could get away with with the ps4 how, um, how do you <laughs> i mean how far along in the design process do you re- realize that and and then decide to carry on anyway right like it like they had to like i i refuse to believe they shipped this game on that system without knowing that these problems were going to be there i think they i think they did know i just think they kind of hoped that people would be okay would with not it. notice <laughs> Maybe, yeah. I mean, it's possible that they just like mostly tested it on PCs. I, I don't know, man. Like, I don't know anything about this studio, so. Yeah, and I don't really either. I mean, I've actually never played the Witcher games, which are like, I, I, and I don't know how many bugs the Witcher games had. Like, if this is a notorious problem for them, I, mm-hmm. I, I just, I just don't know. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's a bummer. Yeah, I mean, I've got a pretty good PC, and I still have those. I still have that effect sometimes, where like if you if you come upon like a car quickly, it looks like a, like a Tesla Cybertruck for a second. And then like the textures yeah. pop into existence. Yeah. So they're doing something weird and unusual. And, and I think like kind of, you know, yeah, novel and unique. And it's just, it's not, not working if your hardware isn't up to it. So that's a bummer. That's yeah. a bummer. All right. Well, that is cyberpunk 2077 available in stores everywhere, <laughs> except <laughs> For PlayStation owners. Except the PlayStation <laughs> store and uh, and maybe just don't bother. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Okay, so um, we're not going to talk about The Mandalorian Episode 7 today because um, we were thinking about what we're going to do next week. Next week is Christmas. Next week's episode drops on Christmas Day. So, And we usually record the night before, and I don't think any of us want to record on christmas eve so um instead of doing like a full long normal episode next week we're going to kind of do like a short bonus episode where we're just going to talk about the mandalorian season two as a whole um because by tomorrow the episode will be out um the final episode of the season will be out so we will be able to look back on the season as a whole and we're just gonna have like a quick maybe like half hour i say that now it'll probably be an hour knowing us matt but Mm. We're just going to do like a quick, quick half hour, a little chat, a little informal chat where we talk about The Mandalorian and why it's one of the best shows on television in 2020. <laughs> um, so that's what we're going to do next week. And then we'll be ba- we will be back the week after Christmas. Um, that episode will come out New Year's Day. We're probably going to have to record that some other time, Matt. But uh, that will be another one of our patron produced episodes. I don't actually I don't have in front of me what we're going to do. Wait, let me look it up, Matt. Matt, I, I got to kill time. Well, I'm um, this up. Uh, yeah, The Mandalorian. It's a great, great TV show. <laughs> uh, we're going to be watching a movie called Freeway, actually. Um, I've never seen this movie. It is a it is a 1996 crime thriller movie, it says. Cool. It stars Reese Witherspoon and Kiefer Sutherland. Uh, Kiefer Sutherland Freeway. Never yes. heard of it. Never heard of it either, but one of our patrons wants us to watch it. So we're going to do that. So that'll be our first episode of 2021. We'll be talking about Freeway. But next week, we'll say goodbye to Mando season two. 
Um, so that's it. That's all we have for you guys this week. If you have any opinions on Guillermo del Toro on a blade two or on uh, cyberpunk 2077 have you played it and do you disagree fundamentally with matt like everyone did about how uh, how good demon souls looks well <laughs> you can reach out to us via email at doofmedia at gmail.com or over on our twitter account at doofmedia yeah and if you're not already subscribed to this podcast we encourage you to do so so that you never miss an episode you can find us on itunes stitcher youtube google play and pretty much anywhere else podcasts can be found and you can find this and all of our podcasts and other shows over at our website, doofmedia.com. We're also running um, something that we did last year. There was a patron exclusive last year called 12 Days of Doofmas, where we each one of us wrote an article on a different Christmas movie or song or thing uh, one day, every day leading up to Christmas. And so we're, we're rerunning those publicly now. It's been a year, so everyone gets to see them. So if you just head on over to doofmedia.com, I think we've released four days worth so far. Um, today's was Daniel's... Um, <laughs> classic, utterly classic. Uh, Star Wars holiday special article, which is... I, I've read that article like 10 times, and it makes me laugh every time. Um, speaking of the Star Wars holiday special, though, Matt, uh -huh. uh, our, our one of our bonus podcasts released by Elliot and Ruben each month is called the high ground where Elliot and Ruben are going through the star Wars prequels and talking about how they're good for some reason, <laughs> which is insane of them to say, uh -huh. but they, they took a break from that this month and they looked at the star Wars holiday special and the brand new Disney plus the Lego star Wars holiday special. Um, so they did an episode of that podcast on that. So if you want to get to listen to that, it's a patient exclusive at our doof troop level. So you can head on over to patreoncom slash doof media and give at the Doof Troop level, and you'll get access to the high ground where you'll listen to them talk about Star Wars and also a bunch of other patron exclusive content. Um, we have a bunch of podcasts we're running every month uh, that Matt and I do, and Matt and his brother do, and um, some of our other guests sometimes do things called Doof Overs. Um, it's just it's a lot of fun audio content exclusive for our patrons. So you can check that out. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's fun stuff. I enjoy it too. Uh huh. Um, yeah. Also, please consider rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts because every single review that we get on there does help us get more exposure. Um, the algorithm does care and new people <laughs> find uh, the podcast that way. So, so it actually really does help if you go give a, a positive review, a good, good five stars and, a, and, a, and an actual review uh, to the Doofcast. We do appreciate that and it does help us. Thank you. Yes. Yes. I'll praise the algorithm. Please make it happy. Please <laughs> feed hail. it. Yes. All right, folks, we'll see you back here next week, maybe if for a little mini Mando episode. But if we don't hear from you or you don't hear from us for the rest of the year, we hope you all have happy holidays. Merry Christmas and, uh, and, and a happy new year. Yeah. Yeah. Goodbye, 2020. Goodbye. You Fuck you. <laughs>